Dr. Montero, over the course of the summertime, there have been a number of these uh, very popular, best-selling anti-racism books that were big enough to reach the top of the New York Times bestseller list, and you and your co-thinkers in the Philadelphia Free School have done a substantial amount of work studying and critiquing these books. What are your initial thoughts on these things? Uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me, Andrew. Um, the first thing is, you know, I reviewed three of them. Um, Eddie Glau, Professor Eddie Glau's book on uh, Baldwin, um, uh, Professor uh, Abraham Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist, and uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste and the origins of our discontent. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it occurred to us that all of these books that had reached, as you said, the top of the New York Times bestseller list and were at the top of the Amazon list of best-selling books, uh, all of these books appear at a particular moment of ideological strife and contradictions within the country. Um, <clears throat> and that's why uh, each of them I, I wrote about um, as um, reflective of the crisis of the ruling class. And I even suggested in the one that I wrote on uh, Ibram Kendi's book that uh, the crisis is not just the general societal crisis, but a crisis of the state, uh, by which I meant a crisis of whether or not the ruling class can rule in the old way and whether or not the people are prepared to allow themselves to be ruled in the old way. And, of course, I got that formulation from Lenin. Uh, and, um, and so they take on the question of race because race is kind of a constant in the history of the United States. And by race, we're talking about two things. One, we're talking about the historic and ongoing oppression and inequality of the African-American people. By most, uh, almost every indicator, black people are at the bottom of, of, of everything. Uh, that's one thing. But the other side of it is uh, the ideological question of race. Uh, which uh, gets to several things, including uh, the attitude of white working people and the white masses in general towards the historic struggle of the African-American people. Uh, I found that each of these books uh, uh, have, have certain common things about them. They want to talk about race without talking about class. Um, Kendi even goes so far as to disconnect uh, racism from relationships of power and therefore of the state and of the ruling class. Uh, there, and, and by doing so, he makes the principle of racist in the society to be uh, either white working people or the white masses or in the case of Kendi, he also says that black people are racist, um, by which he means uh, what, what we generally call white racism. Uh, and I consider this to be an attack upon the working class in general. Uh, uh, by calling the working class congenitally racist and letting, uh, for example, the billionaires in Silicon Valley and on Wall Street off the hook, you're saying that the source of racism uh, and the main reservoir of racism is the working class. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's kind of the way I, I took them on. I want to, for listeners that are not as immersed in your writing and your scholarship and the work that you folks do in the free school, um, see if we can elaborate just a little bit on your own matrix of analysis that you're deriving this from, because I think when I talk with my own comrades and friends about these topics, they're kind of like, well, where do we come at this from, and how should we be thinking right. in terms of this? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, there's a, a very rich 
and robust scholarship uh, on racism and anti-racism. Uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the modern formulation, the post-slavery formulations, uh, begin with Du Bois. Uh, and Du Bois starts uh, to look at the question of race and race relationships in the United States in a scientific way. In other words, uh, many people had spoken of it speculatively, almost metaphysically, but he sought to empirically and historically study the uh, logic of race and racial inequality in the United States. And, you know, he makes this famous statement, which I don't think a lot of people fully understand. Uh, he says that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. Now, the color line is a metaphor for race and racial inequality. But what did he mean by that? First of all, he meant that the United States could never be even a liberal bourgeois, fully liberal bourgeois democracy, as long as racial inequality was so uh, much a part of the system of, uh, of rule, the system of economics, and so on. But the other thing he said is that uh, the color line denoted the relationship on a, relationships on a global scale of the darker to the lighter races of humanity. So he was also bringing into this the question of colonialism in Africa and Asia, the Caribbean, and uh, South America. Uh, so we have a beginning there, and a very substantial beginning. But others have carried on that work. Uh, for, exa for example, Oliver Cromwell Cox's um, uh, work, uh, Caste, Class, and Race, uh, which is published in uh, 1948. It's a massive work in sociology. Uh, but then there is, of course, uh, uh, James Baldwin, who I think is the great American phenomenologist. Uh, and he uh, adds on to the structuralist and uh, uh, historical works of, let us say, Cox and Du Bois. But then, based upon that, there's just an enormous body of scholarship uh, that investigates multiple aspects and sides of the question of race. Uh, in a lot of ways, we talk about the foundational work as being a part of what is known as the black radical tradition, um, uh, which includes also the practice of movements, of organizing, transformative resistance movements uh, throughout the modern history of the United States. So there is a vast body of work. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of this work has been erased or, or swept under the rug uh, uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, a lot of you know people, young and older people, don't realize uh, the radical essence of these works. And so they think that the only place they can go to think, to get radical thinking is to Marxism-Leninism. My argument is that indeed Marxism-Leninism is a magnificent structure, but yet incomplete. And so you need this vast body of work that we call uh, the black radical tradition of Du Bois and, and others. So yeah, that's, that's where I would suggest that people go. And of course, all of the works that I have reviewed uh, in one or another way uh, cancel this great heritage uh, of uh, study and thinking. So let's dive in first with Kendi's work. You point out his background in the evangelical religious tradition, and you say that it resembles a self-help book in many regards. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, well, that's, that's what it is. He, that, and he calls it that. It's a how-to book. Right. Um, and I know that you have been, and many others have been offended by his outright suggestion that Du Bois and other black people are racist themselves, and I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could right. 
elaborate your own feelings on that? Well, first of all, uh, you know, Kendi, uh, whether he's aware of it completely or not, I don't know if he is, uh, he believes or he uses a method which suggests that if you can define something, that means you know it. Uh, so his book is filled with definitions. But as I point out in the review that I did of the book, uh, his definitions are more like tautologies. For example, he will define racism and use the word racism at least two or three times in the definition. So racism is racism. A racist is a person who believes in racist ideas, you know, and that type of thing. So, uh, based on that definition, he gives himself a um, an operationalized uh, way of, of defining who is a racist. And he becomes the ultimate definer. Uh, so he can say that Du Bois is a racist based upon his claim uh, that Du Bois uh, embraced in certain statements that he made racist ideas or supported racist policies. Uh, now, so you, you don't have to study any context. You don't have to know, well, what was being spoken about, why certain language was used, or whatever. It's just a, a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, and, and so he, he reduces everything to these very simple categories. In other words, you're either a racist or you're an anti-racist. Well, but who is to define who is a racist or who is an anti-racist? There are people who, according to their understanding of racism, and albeit, I mean, this is a society where, where we're divided ideologically. And there's so much out there that people are often confused about what is uh, one thing or another. But Kendi, in speaking in these essentialist and absolute terms, would thereby define 90% of the American population, including black folk, as racist. You see what I'm saying? Yes, he even calls himself a racist which is quite extraordinary. Uh, and then he says that even though black folk don't have power, that does not mean they are not racist. Indeed. Yeah, so, you get, so you get the point. It, it really is uh, uh, an absurd uh, set of formulations which have no resonance in any of this you know, uh, rich scholarship on anti-racism. You know, tens of thousands of books and essays and and whatever else exploring this question, let us say, over the last 150 years. And uh, I dare say uh, it would be hard to find a writer who would claim that without power, African Americans are racist. So let's talk about Wilkerson's book, Cast. Um, and it, it bears mentioning, I think, that in the free school, you've had a lot of collaboration and camaraderie with uh, folks from the Indian subcontinent and the diaspora who are active right. participants. Um, so I can imagine they had a very vigorous discussion about this insertion of cast as opposed to the use of just race and naming that concept. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the people from India uh, and Indians in the diaspora uh, were very concerned or took exception to um, uh, Wilkerson's idea or suggestion that, uh, that the caste system, and by the way, Caste is a, uh, the English form of the Portuguese word casta, which uh, is not what the Indians refer to.
to the that hierarchical system. Uh, but at any rate, to claim that this system remained the same over thousands of years, uh, this idea that Indian history kind of stopped at its beginning, so to speak, and it was static. Well, that's the British colonialist idea, and that for India to enter history, it took the British to uh, awaken it. Uh, but so they take exception to that. Uh, the other thing is uh, to claim that you can study the caste system in India without taking into account the various forms of political economy that existed over the many thousands of years in India. You know, that, and then the other thing is to suggest that there was no uh, resistance to caste throughout Indian history. I mean, the Buddhist rebellion of the 6th century BCE uh, was one of the expressions in its history, in Indian history, of the rebellion against caste. There was a rebellion against caste in the period of the independence movement. Uh, so they take exception to this kind of static, uh, this assumption of that Indian history is static. The other thing is, and this is the whole free school uh, saw this, this simplification of, of a caste as, as she applies it to the United States to say there are, th there are three castes, that the upper caste, which would be the equivalent of the Brahmins in India, is made up of all white people, including the white poor and the white working class and the white capitalists. They're all thrown into the upper class, uh, caste. And at the bottom are black people who are the equivalent of the untouchables or the Dalits. And that's all black people, irrespective of class or income or wealth. And then in the middle, she talks about this middle caste made up of what she calls Hispanic and Asians who are striving uh, to enter the upper caste or, or the white caste. I mean, it is, you know, just on the face of it, sociologically and uh, politically absurd. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Wilkerson, uh, and I try to say this in the review that I did, uh, wants to substitute a caste analysis for a class analysis. Um, and at this time of deep class division and the impoverishment of working people, irrespective of their race, uh, and the outlook being more dire than perhaps anything since the Great Depression, in many ways more dire than the Great Depression, uh, where the majority of working people are looking at becoming redundant or unnecessary labor because of what I call the Fourth Industrial Revolution, this, um, this deep uh, technological revolution rooted in the Internet, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. So, uh, and so I say that, you know, Wilkerson, like Kendi, uh, are, represent a preemptive ideological attack that, that comes essentially from the ruling elite, that one-tenth of one percent of, uh, against the working class. So whatever white workers do to resist can immediately be called racist and they be called dregs of society because they are congenital races. Or uh, black people uh, who do not conform to the outlook of these so-called academics are somehow then uh, called racist because, let us say, they want to unite, let us say, with, with white workers in a common struggle. So any unity between black workers and white workers can conceivably be defined as racist. And of course, uh, the woke people, I use quotes around that, are like the, uh, the co-founder of Twitter, uh, which 
uh, who gave uh, $10 million to uh, Kennedy's so-called Institute Against Racism. But, you know, that's the kind of uh, architecture of the ideological struggle uh, that, I, that I see. And I, just going back really briefly to this invocation of caste, the, what you describe this history-free um, yeah, yeah. notion of India and its society, essentially it re is very reminiscent of what Edward Said described in his book Orientalism. And that gesture yeah. itself jumps out at me very yeah. prominently. Yes, yes. I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're absolutely right. And that, you know, and that's the Orientalism that then justifies colonization. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, if applied to Africa, uh, colonization and the slave trade. Right. It's this kind of very American and very metropolitan, middle-class objectification and sort of uh, almost a fetishization, a consumerization of Indian culture. You know, you go and you get your uh, statuary that are supposed to be from various mm -hmm. Indian Hindu gods or the uh, yoga mats or the incense. Um, yeah. And I, I bet you're very familiar with that kind of uh, yes. milieu. Yes. And so that jumps out very clearly to me in this gesture of imposing caste upon a phenomenon that mm -hmm. exists in America as something very differently. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, you're very right about that, and that's very insightful. Uh, you know, the commodification of antiquity, uh, and as though uh, Indians are still in uh, the um, uh, uh, fifth millennium BCE, you know, mm -hmm. that they have come very little beyond that. Uh, but, you know, what I say is that the U.S. system is a race class system, not a caste system. And even the caste system in India, in its, you know, manifestations, let us say, since colonialism and up till today in a lot of ways, uh, is a, uh, a capitalist. It is a class slash caste system. And class in the capitalist sense, in the colonial capitalist sense, re-situated, reconfigured the ancient system. And in fact, a lot of what we know in terms of text and codification of caste uh, was done by the British uh, under the Raj from around the 1840s, late 1840s. Uh, and it was done by them to facilitate their rule over India. So a lot of what people who claim to be experts on caste and, and Wilkerson is not that, by the way. She's at best a dilettante. Uh, but most people, what they know about caste is from British sources. Uh, and, and the great Indian scholar of the ancient uh, Indian world, D.D. Kosambi, uh, he makes the claim that there is nothing that one can say about caste that could not also be contradicted. It is such a variable system. And even in the Indian forecast, for caste system, there are thousands of variation of subcasts and, and subordinate castes within, I mean, you know, please. And so for Wilkerson, knowing nothing about India, I think only visiting there once and staying in a five-star hotel for a conference, uh, is suddenly going to lift uh, what she thinks is caste, uh, which is really derivative of a British scholarship, and I don't think she knows that that well, and then so apply it to the United States. It's absurd. And but it only makes sense in the framework of the ideological crisis of the state, of the ideological crisis of the rule of the capitalist class well, not even the capitalists as a whole, but this um, uh, one-tenth of one percent. Whether one would call it irony or just uh, plain luck, the fact is that you folks at the free school are very enthusiastic about studying Gandhianism and yeah. um, 
So I think that is a very interesting juxtaposition to discuss as well. Mm -hmm. Where you folks derive your notion of praxis and uh, organization and philosophical thought uh, about these issues in our contemporary society informed by Indian philosophy and history? Mm -hmm. Well, anti-colonial India, that's what we were studying. And the connection of anti-colonial India to the black freedom struggle. I mean, you know, once you look at this, I mean, from Du Bois uh, in particular, through uh, Howard and Sue Bailey Thurman, who go to India in 1934-35 to study not just uh, Indian religion, but the anti-colonial struggle, and to see how it was being formed and, and configured. And they meet with Gandhi. And then uh, William Stewart Nelson goes there. Martin Luther King, after Gandhi's death, goes there. He's informed by Howard Thurman and William Stewart Nelson. James Lawson, uh, who was at the center of the freedom movement in the South in the 1960s and was the mentor to John Lewis and Bernard Lafayette and um, James Bevel and Diane Nash and any number of other freedom fighters. Uh, he went there to study the method of struggle in the Indian anti-colonial struggle. So, so we wanted to study the anti-colonial struggle, not to separate Gandhi out and Gandhi and philosophy, but to see how his thinking, and that, let us say, of Martin Luther King and the Black Freedom Movement, converge. But the other thing that we discovered, that a, a strong current in the Black Freedom Movement was solidarity with the anti-colonial struggles in Asia and in Africa. This, so, it's, so how does that inform a, the practice of today. What were, we, what were we trying to say to the younger generation? That there is a path of struggle where the people become central and primary, where it is the building of a united front of the masses uh, to bring about fundamental social change. And here we have the example in the Black Freedom Movement, the anti-colonial struggle in India, the Chinese Revolution, the anti-colonial struggle uh, in Africa. And that's what we were doing. Gotcha. Um, and then finally, this book about James Baldwin by Eddie Gloud. You've done yeah. a tremendous amount of work. I think it's worth at the outset talking about the fact that the popular media in the past 40 years now has really been trying to wrangle Baldwin's public persona and shape it into right. something that's much more gentrified and much more palatable mm -hmm. to mainstream mm -hmm. liberal intelligentsia types at uh, textbook companies, uh, at uh, publishing houses, in the journals of, you know, mainstream literary thought, if it's academic or something like the New York Review of Books. Um, and so I'll just describe what I was exposed to was this notion that I think Gloud repeats, if I read you correctly. Basically, Baldwin mm -hmm. begins his trajectory as something that's much more mainstream and much more palatable, but then there's a certain fundamental break in his thought, and he becomes very embittered, mm -hmm. he becomes much more of kind of almost a crank a political extremist, <laughs> and his re his writings by the end are not as engaging or fulfilling or mm -hmm. as uh, grounded in an authentic expression of uh, what he was elaborating on in his mm -hmm. books like Notes of a Native Son, um, you know, whether the turning point is the fire next time or no name in the street, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is, it, it depends on who's talking. What's your take on where James Baldwin went in the course of his career? 
<laughs> well, first of all, you know, I like the way you set it up. Uh, but over the last uh, almost 50 years, even before Baldwin died, the liberal establishment has been hostile to James Baldwin because James Baldwin was unsparing in his critique of that. Uh, so much of what we get as Baldwin scholarship uh, in the 21st century is um, uh, taken uh, from a lot of the liberal interpretation and liberal hostility to Baldwin. And it goes so deep that Baldwin is treated unkindly even in the LGBTQ community. Uh, he is not a fully accepted icon, even in that community. Uh, and of course, uh, most, and I put quotes, radical young people either don't know him or uh, misinterpret him. Eddie Glaub, in his book, contributes to that. And that's the point I'm making. Uh, as I title my essay, James Baldwin Still Matters, and Eddie Glaub's book on him doesn't. And I meant that seriously. Um, what he does, uh, and, and to use this language itself is uh, humiliating for Baldwin, but to anybody that loves Baldwin. He refers to Baldwin as a fragile gay man. Now, Baldwin was many things. He wasn't fragile. You know, that's one thing. Uh, then he says, uh, and, and the book centers around uh, Baldwin's essay, especially in the book, the 1971 book, entitled No Name in the Street, which consists of two very long, very complex, uh, and very brilliant essays. Uh, and he argues that the book was written from a position of trauma. So you get the, these, this trauma, this sense of white betrayal, this fragility. Uh, and so you left uh, with the, uh, the Baldwin invented by Glau as something very, very uh, less uh, than what Baldwin really was. Baldwin, first of all, he never used this language. Baldwin was a revolutionary. Baldwin was a socialist, uh, openly advocating it. Baldwin aligned himself with the Black Panther Party, with the freedom of Angela Davis, with the freedom of Huey Newton, with the young generation. Uh, he, uh, Glaub tries to make it appear that Baldwin had some naive understanding of struggle and, and so on. Baldwin knew that the struggle would be protracted, and he knew there would be losses. He even prepared for his own death. Uh, so Baldwin, uh, after the 60s, after the assassination of King, you know, becomes stronger ideologically, becomes more committed to going beyond the possibilities of the liberal bourgeois framework. Uh, and, and now seeing that the entire system would have to be transformed. Uh, and that is the Baldwin that would be very inspiring to young people today. But that's not the Baldwin that is taught. I, you know, I'll just say it again. The, the liberal establishment, the liberal academy, will have been hostile to, towards Baldwin for the last 50 years. Right. And um, I think that one of the fascinating elements of particularly No Name in the Street that I think yeah. merits conversation because it also presents a program of action is how he is quite um, evocative and uh, highly esteeming of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And oh, yes. Medgar right. Evers. Um, and I think there's a couple things that are going on in that. First of all, it collapses this liberal juxtaposition of King versus Malcolm X that has been floating around for so long and s presents them as 
at the point of convergence before they both are killed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, and the other thing is Baldwin's uh, meeting uh, in 1962 with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and uh, he expresses in uh, the fine next time that he disagrees with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he sees the good he's doing in the community. And he, he says, interestingly, that one of the reasons he accepted Elijah Muhammad's um, uh, invitation to dinner at his home is because the liberals, the white liberals, had always been uh, uh, disparaging uh, the nation of Islam and putting them down and, and making them a joke. And, and, um, and Baldwin, who knew Harlem, who knew the black community, knew the work, the positive work that they had been doing in the community. So he says, I went in part because the liberals uh, didn't like him. Uh, but then by the time he gets to no name in the street, you know, he's praising Stokely, he's defending Stokely Carmichael. Uh, uh, he might not agree with it all, but he's, he's literally calling for a new united front uh, in the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, and that he, he sees the Angela Davises and the Stokely Carmichaels and the Huey Newtons as a future. And he wants to be a part of that future. He wants, as it were, to be on the right side of history. And he sees them as history making. Right. And I think a good way to close this out is um, to put on the horizon Martin Luther King's notion of the beloved community. and Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, no, yeah. you're, you're, I mean, I think what's happening is a lot of these books, you've mentioned this crisis of the state, this crisis of ideology, and mm -hmm. um, whether you call it a utopia, whether you call it the communist horizon, whatever, <laughs> it's always good to have this finish line in front of you that's maybe not going to be reached even in your lifetime, but it does say mm -hmm. this is what we're aiming for and it's Absolutely. not something like a sclerotic kind of grayish mm -hmm. uh, notion of like repeating the worst uh, elements of mm -hmm. the socialist experiments of the 20th century. It's something much more mm -hmm. fulfilling and vibrant in King's best mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you so much, Andrew. And, you know, I just uh, welcome people to read King, to read and listen to him. You know, for I, I always say that the Baldwinian and Kingian concepts of love were an expression of the highest form of solidarity between human beings. You know, it is, it is a deeper... It is deeper than even class solidarity because it is a commitment to your sister and brother unto death. It's not, so it takes uh, pure economism out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, when, when King talks about a beloved community and the, the operative word is love again, he is talking about a community of human solidarity, of human caring, of human... Uh, uh, purposefulness. Uh, and you're right. Properly understood, it shows a way out of the crisis by uniting the working people. Those who are not making profits off of suffering, uniting them. Uh, Baldwin, you know, brings it out so beautifully when he talks about um, uh, the, the United States as not any longer being Europe or Africa, that we are bound irrespective of our racial differences uh, uh, in ways that can only be expressed qualitatively. Uh, it is not the divisions are more artificial than even we know in the Baldwinian sense of a thing. But, he, you know, he, Baldwin is very firm in his recognition that whiteness has to be rejected in order for humanity to be realized in the United States. But that occurs not in 
physical clashes and confrontation, but in the ongoing process of exemplars of human solidarity, of, um, of educating the moral, political, and ideological education of the masses, uh, etc. So uh, they were very, I mean, this is, this is heavy stuff. And the fact that so much of it has been eliminated from uh, American literature, from the American Academy, is, to my mind, a manifestation of a, a purposeful uh, move on the part of the ruling elite. And, of course, uh, we can't leave out of this the uh, devastation wrought by postmodernism. Uh, taking over academic knowledge and identity politics. Right. Right. Um, are there any further thoughts you have on any of these topics before we close out the interview? No, I just, uh, you mentioned the Saturday Three School, and, and you know, for, for several years, we'll be entering our 10th year uh, in, in, in a few months, but one thing we've always said is that in moments like this, the ideological struggle, the struggle for clarity, the struggle for proper ideas becomes central, even paramount. And uh, that's what we have been trying to do um, with, you know, varying degree of success, uh, but we're sticking to it. 